name is Santa Rosa, as Sarah indicated. Yeah, I am at UC Irvine. I've been here at UC Irvine for many years. So, so today's topic that I want to cover is a long SBRT, but it is going to be a clinical study, essentially a case that we saw here in the uh, radiation, radiation oncology department at UCI. So, okay, so let, let's move on to the next, the next screen. Let me see if this works. Oh, here we go. So I wanted to present, begin my presentation with the, uh, essentially, you know, kind of like if we were to put ourselves in the, uh, in a patient's shoes, let's say. So the patient has come for diagnosis and then the radiation oncologist indicates, well, you know, you could benefit from a stereotactic radiosurgery or stereo stereotactic body radiotherapy. So, and probably, I mean, there could be a very good chance that that patient probably may not understand what that terminology is. So let's say that, okay, you know, we are in the, in that patient's situation. So probably at home and with maybe with the other uh, help of another family member and, and all, we would Google those words, stereotactic and, and maybe even, you know, stereotactic body radiation therapy. And probably, you know, what we would find if we were to do a Google search is that uh, the word stereotactic, and I'm, I'm just going to read what I, what I got here on the screen, it relates or denotes techniques for surgical treatment or scientific investigation that permit the accurate positioning of probes inside the brain or other parts of the body based on a three-dimensional diagram. So now... For what we are doing here, actually, you know, there is some, some essentially aspects of it here. Well, we are not dealing with probes, but here we would be dealing with beams that we are going to be concentrating on a specific location inside the patient's uh, anatomy for delivering a treatment. Now, if we take a look at the uh, stereotactic body radiation therapy concept, we would read the SBRT now, which would be the acronym. It's also known as a stereotactic ablative radiotherapy, administers very high doses of radiation using several beams of various intensities aimed at different angles to precisely target the tumor. So SBRT is typically used to treat small, early stage, non-small cell lung cancers. Well, now these days, actually, SBRT has moved on to other parts of the body rather than, than the lungs. I mean, you know, we can use SBRT for prostate, liver, you know, the spine. So anyway, these are probably some of the early concepts that we had. And actually, as still with the introductory part, if we were to now still with the, uh, the Google aspect of it, do a Google search for any mentation or articles on SBRT, we would find a bunch of them. This is roughly, you know, the first articles that show up if you, if you do, a, again, in Google Scholar, you do a search of the work that has been done on SBRT. And if you were to look in uh, PubMed, which is the, uh, the United States National Database for Medical Articles that, uh, that appear actually worldwide, you could see that just for long SBRT, we have a little under 2,500 articles dedicated to that topic. And, and here, if you look at the, uh, actually this tiny little view graph, I mean, you can see that the majority of these articles or a, or a high concentration of these articles have been published in the us uh, recently in the past five years or so. Okay. So anyway, this kind of like gives you a flavor and probably, you know, something that a uh, that a patient that is about to undergo this kind of treatments probably could be doing at home, you know, in the company of a family member or, or even by himself or by herself. So now we'll, we'll get into, the, uh, into today's topic. So here is the outline of my presentation. So I'm going to be beginning with presenting the, this long SBRT case. It's a clinical case that we saw UCI. So I'm going to be presenting the, uh, the clinical history. Then after that, we are going to move on to the, uh, the setup devices that are, well, you know, that we, that we actually have here in the clinic. And then we are going to focus on the treatment planning. Well, prior to that, the contouring, you know, target contouring, and also contours dedicated for treatment planning, then the treatment planning itself, and then finally the uh, treatment delivery. Okay, so the case that, that we are talking about is of a 39-year-old female uh, initially diagnosed with a primary tumor here was breast cancer. Okay, so, and from there, it metastasized to the, uh, to the right lung. So the whole diagnosis portion of it started in 2012. So this is when her breast cancer diagnosis came to light. 
And, and as, a, as a result, she was treated with bilateral mastectomy followed by reconstruction. And, and, and then thereafter, subsequently, she underwent chemotherapy. So a year later, on a routine chest scan that she received, it was revealed that uh, she had a small pulmonary lesion on the, the right lung. And the location was the right lung's lower lobe. So it was decided to actually monitor the uh, this lesion because uh, it was fairly small. So the decision was not to proceed with any process here to remove it. So just to monitor it to see it's you know whether it would increase in size or not. And unfortunately, it did increase in size. Roughly a year later, 2014, around March, April 2014, a new C- a new CT scan revealed that that the uh, this lesion had increased in size. And, and then a biopsy was done and it revealed that it was a adenocarcinoma. So the, in the following months, the patient underwent chemotherapy to reduce the size and that was successful. The size reduction went from like about 12.4 millimeters to eight millimeters. And, and this was based on a PET CT scan that was done in August of 2014. So in December of that year, the PET-CT that was done then revealed that the tumor had not increased in size. Uh, it, it remained actually fairly stable. But unfortunately, six months or so later, now June 2015, a new PET-CT scan indicated that, that it has actually the size had increased again. And, and essentially, the, the issue well, has significant SUV uptake. So at that time, it was decided that for this patient to undergo SBRT. And the reason being was because the location of the tumor was not deemed appropriate for for actually surgery to be done. So so this is the clinical history for this fairly young lady that, that I am going to be presenting. All right, so let's take a look now at the, the setup that was used. And here I want to take this opportunity to actually give you a slightly, well, let's say a brief history of the, of the different setup frames for that eventually led for the use in a SBRT treatments. So what I am showing you here is a, a setup frame that was developed at the University of Arizona back in 1995. And here on this schematic that you see here, the patient actually was a position in the prone view. So in other words, I mean, facing down. And uh, and this frame was designed with like about three or yeah, roughly three areas of essentially immobilization support applied to the to the patient to the patient. So it was used to actually treat the the spine at the time and and actually provide a fairly good rigidity for this purpose. Now, the, the abstract of an article that was actually published in, in neurosurgery a supplement indicated that this frame actually could immobilize the patient with a positioning error on the order of a millimeter, you know, so a millimeter plus or minus 0.22 millimeters. So it was fairly accurate. Now, also, you know, the, uh, they pointed out that back then in the 1990s, and for a linac based uh, radiotherapy treatment, the Linux at the time did have some, some uncertainty. In other words, the tolerance, the mechanical tolerance of the other uh, machines were not as good as what we have now available. So actually, just picture the following. I mean, you would rotate the gantry, and probably there might be some kind of a displacement, an is- isocenter displacement of like on the order of maybe a millimeter or a little bit more due to the, uh, the, the mechanical uh, tolerances of the time. So in other words, I mean, the, uh, the precision of the machining, the design of the, uh, the Linux itself, the hardware, in other words, I mean, was not as accurate as to what we have now. So anyway, that, that may have contributed to the, uh, the uncertainty position that is, uh, that is being referred here. So then thereafter, now the, the late 1990s, early 2000s, I mean, all different kinds of frames became available and became available for the patient actually positioned in the in the, the supine in a supine format. And, and of course, I mean, with the uh, different immobilization devices available, as I am showing you here in this picture. Here for the, uh, the patient at hand that I was referring to, at UCI, we have the, uh, the following frame. We use this frame. This is actually made by this Canadian company called CDR. 
So the frame that we use here is a carbon fiber frame that actually, I don't know if you can see it on this section. It's a little hard because, I mean, it, it, it is against the other uh, table, the CT tabletop, which is black. But there are some openings in this area. And typically, this frame will come with, uh, with pass. Now, for the purpose of setting up for an SBRT treatment, here in our clinic, we use this standard backlogs, and we have like a actually fairly good sized backlogs. And, and as part of the process, we remove the pads that, go, that come with a frame. So we are only left with the frame itself. And then we take the, uh, the backlog and index it to the, uh, this kind of openings that the frame leaves. So in other words, I mean, we have a backlog index to the SBRT frame, as you can, as you can see here. And of course, the frame itself is equipped with the, a compression device and with the, the paddle here that could be adjustable based on the patient breathing extension, let's say. Now, of course, when we do the adjustment, I mean, we try to keep it. The purpose of the, of the paddle here that we follow in our clinic is for the patient to actually maintain a reproducible breathing pattern. So in other words, we are not suppressing the, uh, the breathing on the patient or try to minimize the breathing as, as much as we can. It's just only kind of like with the, uh, the paddle aiding the patient so that the breathing cycle is, is similar. Okay. So, and then along with that, I mean, we have like the, the other essentially flexible supports. This is for like the, uh, the knees and the legs, and then for the, uh, for the feet as well. And here we have like the, the handlebars for the for the arms. So as I was indicating regarding the the backlogs, so here we have like a two types of backlogs. They're all indexed to the the frame. And as you can see here on this part, the backlogs are are were shaped in such a way that we provide support for the patient's arms. It has it has been now in for for most of the cases. I mean, many many patients sometimes they would have the their arms kind of get tired. So the backlog, uh, again, provides that kind of support and helps in the you know, position reproducibility. Now, there are some, some patients, some other cases where probably they do not feel comfortable being restricted to the backlog, like in the case here that I am showing you. So, so anyway, we have, to, we have to accommodate for, the, for those cases as well. Now, for long SBRT, as the, these pictures indicate, so we acquire a 4D CT scan. So the fourth, the fourth dimension here which correlates with the, the respiration time that we are tracking as well. And, uh, and here for the uh, system that we use for the, the 4DC, the variant RPM system. What I am showing you here is the reflector that actually a camera, which I will show in a minute, uh, will, be, will be reading. So here you can see actually the camera that I am referring to is positioned at the at the foot of the table, and uh, and we have the, the camera that is visualizing the uh, the reflector at, at all times. So the respiration pattern that this patient will have is actually not only monitored but quantified in the RPM software, as you can see here. And and basically, you know what we what we see out of the respiration is some kind of like a sinusoidal pattern that that appears. So, okay, so moving on, in our practice, the essentially the scan range that we, that we follow goes from like maybe slightly below the, uh, the patient's chin on the superior portion of it. And then we go like about on the order of probably five centimeters or maybe slightly more below the, the diaphragm. So here we have like a very nice view of the, the long volumes that we are going to be treating. And during the acquisition, we, we not only acquire the images in a gated format as shown here, but also we have the free, free breathing scans also added to this. So now, kind of like to put it in perspective, and I'm pretty sure that maybe there, there may have been some other lectures that address the acquisition of, of a 4D CT scan in a little more detail. So this probably might be a bit of a refresher. <clears throat> So when we have, or in our practice, when we acquire a 4D CT scan, we have a total of 10 respiration phases, actually denoted by your 0% to 90%. Now, in each one of these phases, each one of them has like the same number of CT slices that are, that are acquired. Now, the difference between the phases, as you probably may have deduced from here, 
it has to do with the, the respiration cycle that we are dealing with. So in here, essentially, we have like a, the, at the phase 0% of the respiration cycle. So as the patient breathes and we are collecting the data with a reflector, remember the sinusoidal pattern that I, that I showed you earlier. So we want to collect all the, essentially at that location, all the different slices, oh, I, not at that location, at that respiration phase, all the different slices, you know, from the superior to the inferior portion that we are scanning, but that correspond to that specific respiration phase. So that's what we do for each one of the phases. So here, you know, we have it like at the time of inhalation, for instance, then this is actually the time of exhalation or beginning of exhalation, I would say here, complete exhalation. Then as we start, <clears throat> as the patient start starts collecting air, and then when it is fully at full inhalation again. So all these different cycles for each one of them, we are collecting the same number of uh, CT images for that volume. And then that way, the uh, in software, the, the system, the, the software package will do what it's called a rebinning. In other words, I mean, put, positioning each one of these images corresponding to each respiration cycle. And that's how we collect or get as a result our 4D CT scan. Now, unfortunately, I could not get this animation to, oh, sorry, that was my bad. I could not get this animation to work, but the, what I wanted to, what I want to show you here is that these days there is software that allows you to actually <clears throat> You, for instance, do the contouring, the target volume contouring at the 50% respiration cycle. And then the software would do the, uh, the propagation of that contour, you know, based on a, a by, by looking at the, uh, the Huntsville units of that volume that, that you just contour and where those, that specific volume and Huntsville units appear in the other respiration phases. And from there, do a propagation in a, in a very automatic manner. Now, that actually is a, a very useful tool to have if we have a tumor that actually is centrally located. So in other words, I mean, if we have the tumor not adjacent to any, any organ, but kind of like in the middle of the lungs, for instance, yeah, that, uh, that a software tool that, that would do the propagation automatically for you becomes extremely handy. But now, what if the tumor that you're going to be treating is very close to, in this case, say the diaphragm or the liver or the or maybe even the ribs, okay? And then you utilize the uh, this propagation tool. The problem there is that the propagation tool may not do or may miss some of the, the target contours in the regions that are in very close proximity to that to that organ. So, and this is what I am trying to illustrate with the with this slide. As you can see here, this is the ITV 50%. This is the, yeah, the one that denotes the propagation done automatically. So here it is given in cyan. So it would be like this kind of a region as shown. And now the ITV 10 in orange, this is actually the, the target that was contour on a each, on each one of the respiration phases done manually, in other words, okay? And by the way, before, before I keep talking about the ITVs, as you may recall, the ITV came as a result of a contouring the CTV. What you were contouring on each one of the phases was the CTV first. And of course, when you then run or display each one of the, the phases in a kind of a dynamic manner, sort of like a movie, you know, what actually that denotes, I mean, the, uh, uh, the expansion here, that becomes your ITV. So here in this graph, the region in, uh, in purple, let's say this is actually corresponds to your CTV. And then the uh, ITV in cyan is your, the structuring in cyan, I should have said, is your ITV. This is for the automatic propagation. And the one in orange is the ITV when you have done the contouring on each one of the, uh, the respiration phases. And what I am trying to highlight is the difference that you see of a part of the, uh, the target being, being missed if you did the automatic propagation. Now, this is a study, actually, this, uh, this kind of an effect observed and published by Underberg. This is actually from an article that appeared in 2005. And, and in here, 
the we are talking about the, uh, the maximum intensity projection for highlighting the, uh, the location of the tumor. But if this tumor is, as I indicated, adjacent to a critical organ, you know, soft tissue organ, the ribs, et cetera, as I, as I was indicating, in this case, the diaphragm, well, you, you probably may miss quite a bit of this tumor. So, so this is actually the, the article if we need to, if you guys need a little more detail on, on this kind of a, a fun effect. So in our clinic, also just to wrap up here, we do not quite use the, the maximum intensity projection. We actually use the average projection for the target delineation. This is actually, you know, a clinic preference. So I, I know that in other clinics, I mean, they use the MIPS or, uh, or the average. So, so anyway, it's definitely, it comes down to, to the comfort on how, how you want to carry out the identification of the other tumor that you're going to treat. So now back to the other patient that we had. So the tumor that this patient, the deletion, or I should say deletion that this patient had actually was in the located here on the, on the patient's right lung. And as you can see here, the contours of the, of the ITV were done in, in the noted here in Cyan. From there, we delineated the PTV, which was a five millimeter expansion. And this is based on the RTOG 0813. This was a five millimeter expansion in all directions. So it was a uniform expansion that was done. Okay, so, so this is what, we, what was had. And, and regarding the RTO 0813 used for the or to treat this patient, so it corresponded to five fractions delivered every other day. So it could be potentially, you know, two treatment fractions in a week, depending on when the treatment started, or it could have been up to three treatment fractions in a week. So the whole completion of treatment would have lasted or would have taken about a week and a half to two weeks to, to do. So, and in between treatment fractions, the RTOG protocol recommends about a minimum of 40 hours of elapsed time between treatments. So, and the treatment prescription here was of 50 gray delivering five fractions. Okay. So now, so now we are gonna get into the part a little more on the, the delineation of the organs at risk that were, that were involved for this treatment. And then from there, of course, I mean, we are going to be moving on to the treatment planning part. So the patient, as was indicated in the, uh, the clinical history, had a, a, a bilateral reconstruction because, I mean, for the, the breast cancer that she was treated with, she received a bilateral mastectomy and then followed by reconstruction. So, so anyway, so the, the breast implants that, that the patient had were consider organs at risk. There were contour, as you can see here, as well as the, the lungs, the heart, then the great vessels like the aorta, et cetera, uh, the spinal cord, the ribs, and then the entire chest wall area. Now, the other thing also, and this is kind of like part of our practice, for this case, we also contour the, the frame, the compression frame that was used as part of the setup. And as indicated here, on the, you know, on this rendering of that, of all the contours. Now, regarding the, uh, the dose tolerances that we followed, once again, we were following our TOG 180813. And this protocol actually is very clear on the, the dose that we, that we need to achieve for, for each one of the, the organs at risk, or I should say the main organs at risk here at hand which in this case happened to be the, the spinal cord, the brachial plexus, the skin. And then in terms of organs, parallel organs, I mean, we are talking about the lungs and serial organs, the esophagus, the heart, great vessels, the trachea, et cetera. So, so this is essentially the, the recipe that we followed for our treatment planning. Now, in, 20, in 2014, actually, Mobius Company published this kind of, this was a chart, a very useful chart, in my opinion, regarding all the different organ, those tolerances for organs at risk based on different fractionation schemes. So, you know, conventional fractionation, a single fraction, three, four, or five fractions SBRT treatments. I am not aware if Mobius actually did any kind of updated version of this, but, the, uh, but this chart, actually, we have it in, in our dosimetry department 
And it is def definitely a very good reference to have to kind of like immediately give you information about the dose tolerances to organs at risk based on the treatment that, that, in, that we are dealing with at hand. So now moving on to the, uh, the treatment and planning portion of it. So this, before, before I start describing this, when it comes to treatment planning, and I've said this many times in the past, my personal take on it is that it is an art. Okay, and there are so many different ways to actually generate a very high quality, clinically acceptable treatment plan. So the technique that I am going to show you here, again, is something that, I, that I've done in the past, has given me very good results, but that doesn't mean that it is how you should be doing treatment plans. I mean, you know, that is up to you to actually develop your own approach, your own style on how to generate the treatment plan. So in here, what I am showing you is the actually the generation of what I call here the PTV for optimization or PTV opti. So here we have the actual the clinical PTV already defined and given here in Cyan. So for the case of, of a long SBRT, you know, and in and if we have the lesion primarily surrounded by air, so I have found that taking that clinical PTV and expanding it by on the order of two millimeters to create a PTV opti actually gives us a lot more control on how to shape the dose distribution to that actual clinical PTV. So here, once again, the expansion is done in all four directions. It's a uniform, uniform expansion as shown. And, and this is actually once, once that PTV opti has been defined, then we want to also have control on conforming the prescription dose to that PTV volume as conformal as possible. But then again, also we need to keep in mind that we want to have a very good dose gradient as well. So here, in addition to the uh, defining the PTV opti, I define two uh, avoidance or avoidance structures. And this one right here is actually to conform the dose to that PTV opti that I was referring to. So it is a very, very tight, essentially here on this uh, two dimensional view, it looks like a donut, but actually what it is, is sort of like a, a, a spherical shell that is enclosing the, uh, the PTV opti here in all directions. And the separation between the PTV opti to the, uh, the inner shell volume right here is on the order of a millimeter as well, maybe a little less. But this is actually a, the structure that we are going to utilize to guarantee a very good dose conformity to our clinical target, which is the goal, the clinical PTB. Now, the similar idea is applied also for controlling the, uh, the dose gradient. Now here, the separation is a little, a little bigger, typically on the order of five to seven millimeter separation. And again, we want to have a very good gradient dose distribution achieved in, the, in this plan. So when for the, uh, this particular case, we treated it with our true beam SDX, and I'm, I'm going to be showing the, uh, the machine in a moment. And, uh, and as you can see here on this uh, diagrams, based on the location of the tumor, the, we could not use a full arcs. And by the way, the technique that was used as indicated here in the title, it was a VMAT, a volumetric modulated arc therapy technique using rapid arc. We are a variant department, so, so a rapid arc, you know, is our VMAT technique that is used routinely here in the clinic. Now, so back to the, uh, the, the location of the tumor and the limitation on the arcs. So we had to use partial arcs. So in this case, we had, we define a total of four a partial arcs where each one of the arcs had a, a trajectory in terms of an angular trajectory of 230 degrees. So, and, and the beam quality that was used for delivering the treatment was six megavolt FF flattening filter free beam. And we have here the, uh, the AAA algorithm configured. We also have accurate, but anyway, I mean, it's uh, definitely we can, it, it can be the dose distribution could be probably further improved with an, uh, the, uh, using the accurate algorithm, but we are fairly comfortable with AAA as well. So, so here is the, uh, the view of, of the techniques. And this is the, uh, the optimization that was done. I apologize. I mean, this is an old version of Eclipse at the time that when we did the, uh, 
the patient was treated. Uh, in our clinic, we had version 11, I believe, Eclipse version 11, version 10. So we had not upgraded to version 15 or higher. So, so this is the optimization window that was coming with that version. So as you can see here, the ability of having the PTV opti delineated by this dose volume histogram, this dynamic dose volume histogram, and then here is your PTV, your actual clinical PTV. So one, one of the abilities that this tells you is that you try to maximize the dose to the PTV opti, and then automatically that improves the, the dose to the PTV, to the clinical PTV, which is, which is your objective. Okay, so again, this, these are just personal techniques. For me, this is, uh, gives me a lot of control. It works fairly well. And the same concept is applied to the, the avoidance structures to actually make the, the conformity, the dose conformity to the, to the volume very, very tight and also yield a very tight gradient dose as well. Now, along with that, I am not showing you for because otherwise this view would have been a little too busy, but we need to keep track of the, uh, the dose to, to the organs at risk that were contour, you know, the rest of the lungs, uh, the esophagus, et cetera. So all of them have to be minimized according to the other uh, dose tolerances that, that are indicated in the, in the RTOG table. So- Dr. Roy, uh, yes. yeah. there's a request to take a uh, break and answer some questions from the audience. I don't know how you feel about that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That? yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Go for okay, it. Okay, great. So the first question was from Shkar. I think he was asking about the 30 year, 39 years old female case, and he was wondering what the symptoms were, if you know. Oh, what the symptoms were? He said, what about symptoms? So I'm guessing oh, he meant- Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Actually, and yeah, I don't think that I included that in the history. When she presented to our clinic, I mean, the patient did not have any visible symptoms. I mean, she actually was very, appeared to be very healthy, definitely a very active 39 year old, very, very fit. I mean, she indicated that she would work, you know, work out and do yoga. I mean, she was a very yoga aficionado. So, so in that regard, I mean, the symptoms were not quite visible. I mean, it, it was just that uh, essentially, you know, from the CT scan, having seen that lesion. You know, that was, that was a concern. So yeah, no visible symptoms. I mean, no, no shortness of breath or any, any of that, those things. And the CT scan was made because she's, uh, she had the history of breast uh, cancer, right? So it was more of a follow-up. Well, it was, it was due to the, uh, the follow-up, for instance, that, uh, that they found out about this uh, lung lesion. Okay. So, so that was something that uh, anyway, you know, that, that's how they identify it. And, and in fact, I mean, after that, as I mentioned in the history, they decided to monitor it first because, I mean, it was a very small lesion. They did not want to go there and take it out. And uh, they wanted to see if it would stay like that or, or, or it, it would begin to grow. Because initially, you know, when they were decided to do the monitoring, I mean, they were not sure if it would have been cancerous lesion or not. And they were trying to minimize having some kind of like an invasive procedure done on the patient. Next sense, next sense. Next question is from Bilal Shahroor. Can you please identify the difference between MIP, MIP and AIP? Oh, can you repeat that question? The definition of MIP? Yeah, he's asking you to differentiate, I guess, or identify the difference between the maximum intensity. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, okay. Let, yeah, let's go back. Probably we can, we can, all right. Okay, so the MIP is, the definition of MIP is the maximum intensity projection. So essentially, you know, with the with a MIP, what you are what you are doing is you are kind of like taking your image and looking at the the acronym indicates the maximum intensity. In other words, I don't want to probably I'm not so sure if it is truly related to the Huntsville units, but on how you are presenting the the image, I mean, you want to make you want to make that volume as bright as possible. Okay, you know, the intensity on the display, the highest contrast possible, I would say, for the for that volume to be to be shown. Okay, the contrast that would highlight it. But the problem there, okay, when you do it this way, which is ideal, I should say, if you have if you have a lesion that is surrounded by air, okay, you know, you are actually concentrating or showing the a very, a very nice contrast a very, the maximum intensity of it being shown 
Okay, because I mean, air is going to be essentially black, let's say, you know, in the ideal scenario. So that, that lesion will highlight. Now, what I was getting in here is that, okay, so you have like your lesion, you know, being like really white, the maximum intensity. But then again, the rest of your image also, you know, for your soft tissues are also being projected just looking at the, uh, the maximum intention, intensity of those soft, you know, those adjacent organs as well. So in, in this particular case, so if the tumor that you're interested is in adjacent to one of these soft tissues, well, then you're going to miss it. You know, you're going to miss it. Now, what is the definition of your average intensity? The average intensity in here is essentially you are kind of like setting the, uh, your image contrast to basically, you know, like the default settings <laughs> that your scanner may have. Okay. And typically in our clinic, and this is what I was uh, indicating, that's actually, you know, what we use to, to, to highlight the, uh, the location of the, uh, the brain tumor. Oh, well, the location in this case of the, uh, the lung tumors and also a, the other structures nearby. So, so that's what we use. We don't, we don't typically deal with the, with the MIP, with MIP images, you know, for identifying the lung tumor. So does that answer uh, the question? Or? I think it's, it does somehow. So the way it's done usually at every, at every location, we take different phases, right? So with mm -hmm. MIP, you pick the phase that has the highest intensity at that location, and then you go further, right? Well, for AIP, you take the average, right? Yeah. So I think the average is one that more represents or is the closest to the helical scan, I guess, right? Or to reality, at least. Yeah. Well, MIP is exaggerated, right? No, yeah, that, that, is, that is actually, that is actually, that, that, that is actually correct. But as you can see, uh, the end result of all of this, whether you know you have like a helical scan done or you have like a cine type of scan done, you know, essentially what you it has to also or it is correlated to the uh, the contrast, you know, on how you are displaying the image. For instance, in here, you know, I don't know if you can see. Okay, so these are all images. This is these are all maximum intensity projections. So you see this very, very high concentration, you know, a very high contrast, very nice and white. And then you see also the vessels coming in. I mean, it's very, very nice and white. If this would have been like an average, you know, projection, average intensity, this would not be as white. I mean, you still would be able to identify it, but you know, it would not be, or you, in other words, I mean, probably you may have, this may not be as wide. You may have other other regions also showing up here, because I mean the uh, you are kind of don't you are not fully concentrating on. In other words, I mean other intensities you know will be will be showing up. You may have a little more elements being shown. I I guess I I probably may need to tighten up my my description a little bit more. I mean and and we can talk up on this offline if. But I hope that at least you know I gave. I conveyed some of the, the differences, but I don't know. Okay, okay. Next question is from, uh, she's, it's, so we have to contour based on ITV-10, go through all respiratory phases in order not to miss any of the IT. Okay, yeah, on this particular case, that is correct. The, uh, the CTV, okay, the CTV was contoured on each one of the respiration phases, okay? And then from there, we created an ITV, which is the ITV-10. So the ITV-10, now, this actually is taking into account the motion. So as you can see here, the ITV is fairly larger, you know, compared to, and this was a comparison that was done with the, the automatic projection done by the, uh, by the software. So yes, the answer is absolutely right. We, the physician here, do the did the CTV contouring on each one of the respiration phases, and once that was done, we created the ITV. Doctor Nandi, you you stressed that we can do that when we have a critical organ that we are afraid to miss, like the diaphragm, the mm -hmm. the ribs. In such a case, we can do it, but. In 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 this case, if we if we go with the automatic, we will miss anything. Yeah, as a matter of fact, in this particular case, we did. So this is what I was trying to highlight. 
because I mean, here is the automatic given in, in Cyan. You know, this is the ITV automatic. And this is the, uh, the, IT, the orange is the ITV done manually, you know, the contour on each one of the faces. Okay. You see what I mean? So here, okay, yep. this is just only like a, a 2D cut. This is the coronal view, but you can see all this region right here that, that was being missed. Okay. But, you know? Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a question then as a follow-up yeah. to this question. If you're going to contour and create your RTV for all phases, then are you treating with free breathing or are you gaining in this case? Oh, in this particular case, actually, we did not we did not use a gating. Okay, that makes okay. sense. Now. Okay. So we didn't use the gating. I mean, we from from the ITV that we had, we created a PTV and then we just proceeded to treat the, the patient without gating. Okay. But now you're absolutely right. I mean, once once we are contouring the, the ITV, we definitely create a PTV as well. But we actually, you know, now, now we have new physicians here and they do want to do the treatment a specific using gating in a specific portion of the respiration, you know. So yes. yeah. This no, makes sense, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So Isam Lalia actually asked the same question, but I just asked you. Mm -hmm. I think he has the answer. And Dr. Ahmed, uh, Dr. Shaha Ahmed also asked, what is the difference between avoid and avoid 50%? Oh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's see. Let's go there. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Okay, so we did the, the PTV and define the PTV opti. Yeah, so... Yeah, yeah I, I didn't understand this line. I'm sorry to repeat it again, but I didn't understand it anymore. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, oh, Soha. Yeah, no, no worries at all. Oh, good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dante. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. No, not a, my, my pleasure. Not a problem Thank you. at all. Thank so, you. so the in here, okay, so the avoidances, the whole purpose of the avoidance structures that I have defined here, I just are just purely for optimization purposes. So this avoidance, you know, the, the first one that I have here and the difference, as you can see here, you know, it is very, very tight on the inner, the inner volume, the inner wall, let's say, you know, to the, to the PTV opti. So the objective of having this avoidance is actually to a uh, control and conform the prescription dose to the to the PTV, in this case, I mean, ideally we want to conform it to the PTV opti the best, in the best manner possible. So at the time of optimization, we put a lot of a kind of like a upper dose limits to, to this structure so that the end result of that is that at the prescription dose only concentrates around the periphery of the, uh, the PTV opti volume. So this is actually the, the purpose is conforming the prescription dose to the, to the target volume. The objective of this other structure right here is to actually conform the gradient dose. So in this particular case, the patient was receiving a prescription dose of 50 gray. So here we want to conform the, the 25 gray isodose line to be within this region. In other words, very, very, also very conformal to the target volume, but at some, some separation, a few millimeters away from it, but also to have the, uh, that 50% isodose line very nicely conform. That, that was the purpose of it. So it is purely for a treatment planning purposes. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, 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 let's say, I, I don't want to say that, but it's this, the, it's synonym to the idea of the gamma knife. We are taking care about the 50% the, to tighten the, the target and make it much hotter. Yeah, uh, am that's I right? absolutely right. Yep, exactly yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. And in that regard, that, that is absolutely right. We are trying to achieve that, uh, you know, with a C-arm Linux, <laughs> because I mean, yeah. that, that, that's what the, the true beams, the electas, and all of those standard radiotherapy Linux are, you know, C-arm Linux. So yeah, yeah. So, so the main purpose of the avoid and the avoid 50 is to squeeze the ice dose to, to be much conformed to the target. Uh, okay. Yeah, that is correct. Okay. That Thank is you absolutely so much. right. Yeah, no worries. My 
my pleasure. A couple more questions. Would you like to yeah, take yeah, them or do you want to yeah. keep them till the end? Up to you. Well, let's get, let's uh, finish the question. So uh, yeah, no, okay. no worries. So so may I ask, please, if I if we have a same case, but the patient for medical reasons she can't have a regular breathing and we couldn't achieve a good 4D images, and also she can't hold her breath for ABC. Is there a way to do the SBRT? Oh. I have such case, and I'm thinking what is the best breathing control method to deliver the lung SBRT for a small lower lung uh, lesion? Yeah, and that's a very good question. It would require some kind of an assessment. Okay, I mean, I uh, trying to trying to come up with a, a standard or general answer to that might be a little difficult because I mean, you need to you need to see what the you know what the patient status is. Probably SBRT may not be an appropriate technique for that patient. Okay, so if a patient, more than likely, if the patient has a very erratic breathing, it, that typically is an indication that this patient has already very advanced disease. You know, probably the uh, the lung region probably maybe maybe highly compromised. I don't know. I mean, I, I am I am assuming, and if that is the case, probably techniques not like this, but maybe like your standard APPA techniques or so could be maybe more beneficial for this patient. If we truly were to have, say, if that is not quite the case. And if we are dealing with a, a small lesion or a regular size lesion, but then the rest of the lungs are fine, it is possible that if the breathing is shallow, okay, if the patient does not have like very prolonged breathings, I mean, you know, we have like a very shallow breathing. We have encountered situations where we probably just do a free breathing scan and do the planning on the pre breathing scan and treat the patient that way. So again, you know, you generate your ITV and then from there your PTV and then just proceed to treat. We can use on the setup side, have the patient set up with a compression just so that we can kind of like minimize the breathing. And during the delivery time portion of it, actually a, essentially have a, the gating settings set up on a full amplitude. And we know, we know how much of the breathing the patient would have. As I indicated, the patient is a shallow breather. You have like a, an upper and lower limit for that, that kind of sinusoidal pattern that you would have, which would be very, very you know, shallow. You would not have very big peaks. And then if the patient were to go up, uh, above it, well, of course, I mean, the system would be stopping it, but that could be another, another approach. Then again, I mean, I cannot, I cannot give any other specifics because, I mean, we would need to see, you know, what the, the patient situation would be, but that, that could be something that could be explored. May I add, if you don't mind, may I add, this happens also in our clinic sometimes. I agree the 4D images wouldn't be necessarily great. They would be choppy, like they would have the piano key effect sometimes, and the phase error could be high, but that doesn't prohibit us necessarily from create, knowing at least the extension of the motion. So I still use that 4D image, even if we're treating with just regular IMRT or VMAT, but at least I have a sense that I look at the tumor volume and make sure that it's like to create an ITV basically, even if I'm not going to use it for gating. So to your case, basically. I don't know if that's a, also a legitimate- I think, I, think, uh, or not. I think in that regard, I mean, I would I would actually have to have to see, you know, we need to we need to see how the how the patient truly breathes because I mean it, it comes down to a patient by patient basis, you know that could be an ideal scenario if there is some kind of reproducibility on the breathing, but but then again I mean I yeah I, I don't know it, it it comes down to to the different cases in my opinion. Sorry, I think it's, this is the last question and then we'll resume. Okay, in, it's from. Seth Roman, TKR, in case of lesion very close to rib, do you still take five millimeters uniform margin for PTV from ITV? And I want to know the definition for, of PTV opti for planning in such case. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Well, the as a matter of fact, I mean, in this particular case that I am presenting, as you as you can see, the uh, the lesion was very close to the ribs. And the expansion from ITV to PTV was done in a uniform manner. 
that was a, a decision made by the uh, radiation oncologist. When it comes to the to the avoidance structures, yeah, I did not discriminate as to whether you know the the target was adja- adjacent to the to the ribs or not. I mean, it was a, the avoidance structures actually essentially were defined uh, regardless on the uh, the location of the target just with the sole purpose of confirming the dose to the uh, the target volume and also confirming the uh, gradient dose as well. Now, uh, once done that, if the dose that a rib might be getting still too hot, then of course, I mean, you know, you can proceed to to actually retailer that if, if necessary. But from our experience or my personal experience on this, I mean, usually this technique has worked fairly well. So, so yeah, that's... You know, that's my comment on that, on my answer to that question. Great. I suggest we resume now with the presentation and we'll take more questions. Okay. The rest of the questions till later. Yeah. Thank you. Good. So we were, I think we did touch a little bit on this. Well, since we were talking about a PTV opties and avoidance sectors, maybe this now might make a little more sense. So at the time of the optimization, as you can see here, we want to, I typically, you know, was optimizing on the PTV opti structure, trying to make it, you know, very, very close to the, to the prescription dose. And as you would do that, the, the actual PTV, the clinical PTV definitely was conforming to the prescription dose fairly well. And here you're trying to control or make, make the, the dose distribution as, as more conformal as possible by reducing as much as you, as much as possible you know, the, the upper limit dose to the avoidance structures. So here is the avoidance 50% avoidance uh, for the actual prescription dose. So anyway, that's uh, the techniques that are on for the, the treatment planning side that I was describing. So the end result that we got here was the following. Here you can see on the axial plane, the dose distribution actually conforming to the clinical target volume fairly well. And here in dark blue is the, the 50% isotope line or the 25 gray. Also, also being, you know, very, very conformed to the target volume as well. And you can see here the, uh, the dose distributions in the other planes. Here you have it in the coronal, the sagittal, and, and here you can see the, uh, the dose volume histogram. Well, you know, and of course, I mean, the, the dose to the other organs at risk that, that resulted. So if we were to take a closer look at the, at the dose volume histogram. So I have a question now for the audience. So here you have the PTV and here you have the ITV. Okay. So, so now, can you tell me, well, the question that I have is, the maximum dose for this particular case, where is it located? Inside the PTV or inside the, the ITV? Well, I mean, yeah. Inside the PTV. Well, it would be inside the PTV, but what I was trying to highlight, maybe the question that I posed was not quite accurate. You see the ITV here? The maximum yes, dose inside the ITV there. is a little less. Yeah. So we noticed this actually, and but our attending was okay with that. So we proceeded to treat. Ideally, okay, what we want to have is, so you have like your PTV dose that comes here. The ITV dose should have been something that goes like this, you know? So you want to have like the maximum dose within the ITV volume. So... So anyway, it was, again, in this particular case, I, I, well, you know, we, again, we notice it maybe slightly after the fact, but, uh, but then again, on the clinical side, I mean, our attending indicated that it was. Because, because the, because the dose on the ITV side is much tighter than the PTV because the PTV is much broader. So, so yeah. we will, we will have our maximum dose near the, the ITV margin. Well, but it's like still, to, it's inside the PTV. Yeah. I, well, the, the PTV encloses the ITV, of yes. course. But yeah. you want to concentrate the maximum dose within the ITV volume. You know, that, that's what I was trying to get at. Uh, okay. okay. So you how know, did this happen? Since the PTV typically encloses, encompasses the ITV. Did they yeah. clean it up a little bit? And uh-huh. Yeah, it was it was slightly it was slightly outside the, the ITV. Because you see, you're giving, you're giving like a five... 
five millimeter, in this, in this case was a five millimeter margin, you know, growth from the ITV to the PTV. You see what I mean? So, so the max, so the high, the hot spot in this particular case was slightly outside the ITV. Does that make sense? It does, I guess. I yeah. mean, yeah. You know, so that's why, you know, when we were, that's why here the ITV, the maximum dose is somewhere around here. Because okay, ideally, so, as so I, it was in PT, the PTV was not five millimeters all around the ITV, right? There was some side, a side. No, 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 it was, no. it was, it was, all, it was all around it. You know, the uh, the PTV was all around. It was enclosing the entire ITV. Okay. Oh, okay. You know, but the thing is that the hot spot, for some reason, you know, and I, I can recall the details. I mean, this is a plan that was done like you know five or so years ago, but the uh, it appeared that the hot spot here was slightly outside the ITV volume. I see, I understand. You know, and that's why when we when we have the, uh, the display here, okay, well, yeah, no, the IT, the PTV does, it's a little higher, you know? If you follow the, the PTV, here we have the maximum dose, while the ITV is a little less. And that's what I was trying to tell you. You know, ideally on this kind of cases, you want the, the hotspot, to be within the ITV volume, you see? So as a result, okay, so we have our PTV going here. So the ITV would have been like that and then have like, rather than going this way, we would have the ITV going like that. Does that make sense? Makes so th sense. this is a defect in the plan or or we will accept it in any way? Well, the, uh, at the time, our radiation oncologist accepted it. Okay. But um, this is not the optimum. You say it is that not, it is not yeah, the optimum yeah. case. Yeah, I, I, and I, I brought this up, you know, kind of, I've been using this case, you know, sort of like as a, as a teaching aspect. But then again, on the clinical side for this particular patient, I mean, the plan was our radiation oncologist accepted it. I mean, it was fine, you know, clinically. But ideally, you know, when you are generating this plan, eh, well, you know, you want to you wanna make sure that the, uh, the maximum dose if, is within your ITV. It's the same concept also when we are dealing with, uh, say, intracranial SRSs, you know? So you have your GTV, and then to that GTV, you are given a margin, typically a millimeter to two millimeter margin to create your PTV. But then the maximum dose, you want it, the hot spot, you want it to be within the GTV. You don't want it to be within the uh, this kind of overlap, not overlap, but you know that region between the, the PTV volume and the GTV volume. Does that make sense? Yes. You know, so, so that's what I was trying to get at. So it is it is the same the same approach. So here we have also on this DBH the the dose distribution for the uh, the lungs, a uh, for the heart, and, and the liver. So now if we were to put it in perspective regarding the uh, where we are at based on the RTO parameters, you know, so let's do an analysis of the uh, the coverage. So here we have our PTV to the right lung, but the dose that we, that we were giving was fifty gray. The target volume, the PTV, in other words, volume was 12.8 cc's. Now we took, we converted the isodose into volume, the prescription isodose into volume, that was 13.6. So the conformity index that we got from both numbers was like 1.06. That's actually very good. You know, we want to, we want to make it as close to one as possible. So, so this is what we got. Now under that, those conditions, the, the prescription isodose here was covering 95.3% of the, uh, the target volume. And now if we look at the, at the dose at 100% of the volume, that was at 47.3 gray. And the dose at 90% of the volume, that was 50.8. Now, so, so here, uh, again, this is the uh, conformity index. This right here is the gradient index. So this is how, how good Oh, oh, well, you know, we want to, as, I, as I've been mentioning, we want to make the 50% isodose line as conformal as possible as well. So we got a, a factor of 4.9. And also there is another parameter that RTOG 0813 talks about, which is the, the maximum dose 
that that you can have two centimeters away from the from the PTV. This is actually two centimeters, if not if I recall correctly, from the uh, the periphery of the PTV volume. Okay, so so we did that, and and well, we got this essentially a little shy of fifty percent. And then the uh, the protocol also has some limits for the in terms of the percent those to the lungs, the percent of the lung receiving 20 gray in total or the V20. So these were the values that we got. This is for the ipsilateral lung, so the right lung, and this is for both lungs. And then the, the protocol has this very nice table. So in our case, I mean, our volume, target volume was essentially 13 cc's, let's say. So we kind of like are in this, in this type of a category right here. And, and here we have the deviation, you know, for the conformity index to be less than 1.2. Well, we got, you know, 1.06. This is actually a minor, you know, what is no deviation. This is minor deviation. And the same here for the, the gradient index. So in here we are kind of like somewhere in between. I'm not sure if it is non or minor. Well, let's call it. So we were within the other minor deviation. And then here for this other parameter, we were in no deviation. Regarding the lungs, yeah, essentially also no deviation at all. So this is kind of like how we went to about evaluating this plan. Uh, and the delivery, we did it using our TrueBeam SDX. So this is actually the machine that we have that is equipped with the high definition MLCs. What makes it high definition is that if we do a projection of the MLCs at ISO center, we have a width of 2.5 millimeters on the central region. And on the sides right here is like the width is five millimeters. And it has a maximum dose rate of 24 gray per minute if we use 10 FFF beam. So for this case, we use a six FFF beam that basically is like a 1400 or 15 gray per minute maximum dose rate. And also our machine has this collection of electron energies that are, are available. So this is actually essentially on the treatment side of it now. The Combeam CT that was that was acquired to actually deliver a treatment and and well, you know what was deemed appropriate. And here are the uh, the parameters between the uh, on the image and the treatment side that we got that was acceptable. This was essentially like a, an image comparison, you know, between the the DRR and and of course what was taken on the machine. And this is a flora. Flora image. Again, this was a video I cannot. Oh, there you go. It's kind of hard to see the, the volume, but but we were essentially on target. And this was for the delivery. Here you can see actually, you know, how we were doing the, the treatment. Again, as I indicated, we had no gating going on here, but we were controlling the, the amplitude. Okay. So if this would have been a gating treatment, we would have had like an upper and lower limit at specific locations of the, uh, the sinusoidal wave shown here. So this actually is an additional case. This is not an, a long SBRT, but it was, I thought that it was an interesting case to bring up. This was from a colleague of mine, not from UCI, but also a, of a patient, a long patient as well, that was treated with using Veeam. I, for the sake of time, I mean, I'm not going to go into all the details. I mean, this is something that you can read. But here, this is the, uh, the lesion that was that was included, fairly, fairly big size lesions, two of them, one of them going to, you know, 60 gray, the other one going to 50 gray. So the big one going to 50 gray right here. We use, well, he used a PET CT for the, uh, the fusion. And I kind of also for educational purpose, uh, did a, the treatment planning for this case. I generated here an avoidance structure, which was basically the entire body here, excluding the other region of the targets. And, and just for conformity, I had like a one to two millimeter separation from the, the target volume in the avoidance and the avoidance. Okay. So this was also a, a VMAT plan. There were a total of three arcs that were defined. Again, could not be complete arcs due to the, the nature of the tumor location. But as you can see here, the conformity that was achieved was fairly, fairly good. And here are the other dose volume histograms for each one of them. Uh, again, I, I don't want to go into too much detail for the sake of time. Mm -hmm.
Thank you.